Welcome to the Successful Athletes Podcast, where we interview successful athletes to make you a faster cyclist. This week, we are joined with Jack Turnbull out of the UK. How are you doing, Jack? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. How are you? Doing great, man. I appreciate you taking the time to have a conversation here where we can hopefully dissect a little bit or maybe just share and chat about your performance so then other people are probably going to pick up something useful from it. So I appreciate you doing it. Yeah, no worries. I look forward to it. So if you're listening to this right now, you can head over to the trainer road forum and you can find an episode or a a thread dedicated to this episode where you can go through and find details, ask Jack questions, uh, ask any of us questions, and we can dig into any of the topics that we cover here. You can also head over to trainerroad.com if you want to become a faster cyclist like Jack. So Jack, where are you based out of in the UK? We should probably start there. Give us your age, where you are, what you do for work and family. Uh, so I'm 28. I live in London, West London. Um, I live at home with my girlfriend and I am a designer. But I'm sort of in between jobs at the minute because of the whole COVID thing. So, <laughs> why? <laughs> Lovely COVID. So if anybody's looking for an awesome and fast designer with a, uh, with high power to weight <laughs> ratio, Jack's your man. <laughs> uh, D- uh, Jack, when you say you're a designer, what sort of design work do you do? Uh, just out of curiosity. Uh, so it's like product design, 3d product design. Uh, so working with, uh, CAD, like SOLIDWORKS programs like that. Awesome. Cool. That's that must be a lot of fun. There's so many products in the cycling world that I'm sure like you think of probably very differently than the rest of us do. Yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd love to get, I'd love to get into it, into that sort of area, but as you can imagine, it's super competitive. Yeah, I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. Yeah. Well, cool. Uh, so let's, let's, we're going to talk about your performance and your improvement today. So just in general, uh, Jack, you haven't won any national championships or anything, right? No, 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 no Everesting world records, <laughs> nothing like that. And instead it'll be much more focused on the fact that, look, it's, it's not, we, we say this all the time. People want to know like, what's the, what's the key thing I'm missing or, or what's something that everybody else is doing that I'm not. And it's just diligence. It's just consistency. And that's kind of a, a common thread here and what we'll talk about. But I think within that, we'll have some actionable takeaways for sure. Before we get into all of that, were you always a cyclist, Jack? So I started cycling probably about 18 years old, but that was just sort of to and from university. I got a sort of what I thought at the time was a road bike, but looking back, it was a, it was a, definitely a hybrid, like just a city bike with sort of narrow tires. But even, even riding that was so much different to sort of riding the mountain bikes as a kid, like just around town to the park and stuff like that. So I uh, enjoyed more the the speed that came with riding that came with riding the narrower tires, even if it was just going to and from university. When I um, did my placement year, so I did, like an internship sort of thing during uni, the guys in the office they no one was into football or soccer, so I sort of had to, which was what I was into or what I am into. So I had to sort of adapt because they were sort of big in big into bikes, like both road, mountain, everything. They loved it all. So I sort of that's where I picked it up a bit, bit more. So after that, I sort of go out on the weekends, whereas I wouldn't have done before. But still, it was just cycling for commuting, really. Mm. Um, it, it stayed like that for a while, and on the weekends I would play football, but I started to get a few injuries, and sort of fell out of love with it you could say so i started cycling more because i didn't get injured well not like it was my ankle that was i would always roll my ankle and i'd never i you it's sort of impossible to do that on a bike when you're clipped in <laughs> hopefully right <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> unless you crash i guess <laughs> yeah so uh yeah, I just started. I started to sort of take more joy in in riding outside, really, and that was just on that was just on my own at the time. Um, Do you mind if I ask? So, soccer or or, or football, depending on where you're listening to this from, I will refer to it as football from here on out to to simplify it. Just know that we're not talking about the big Americans and pads uh, hitting <laughs> each other on the line of scrimmage. So, uh, when we we talk about that sport, it's an interesting crossover point. Because, uh, soccer is commonly spoken about 
in terms of lateral movements and lateral agility and strength in that regard. Whereas cycling is very much forward facing movement and it, it's not as simple. And you can hear this on the ask a cycling coach podcast that we did with Kelly Sturette. It's not a single plane movement, Like you know, your, your hips and knees and everything else aren't really designed to operate like a bicycle operates, but so it is more complex than that. But did you find coming over to cycling that soccer had prepared you in any specific ways or had you at a particular disadvantage in any ways when you came over to the sport of cycling? When I was, up, when I was doing both at the same time, the only sort of fallout from that was that my knees would hurt. It would, it would hurt my knees, but it was only for sort of a day or two after, after the match, after the football match on the weekends. But so sort of physiologically, there was there was no sort of advantage or disadvantage. I suppose there was a bit of that sort of cardio base from playing football. But if ever I run now, you you wouldn't know that I that I am a sort of sort of strong cyclist because I can't. You know, I ran I ran five k sort of months ago now. Haven't run since because it wiped me out for the week. I could I could barely walk. Like my legs were so stiff. So now I do not run. What <laughs> position did you play in soccer? So I, I was some sort of a defender or midfield or midfield. So you did a lot of running then as a midfielder. Yeah. 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 So that, that's one thing that I'd be, I'd be interested. I mean, were you athletic your whole life or did you feel like just the sport of soccer or football, forgive me, brought you to the point where you were athletic to ease that transition into cycling? Well, to be honest, I, I wouldn't say that I was athletic and still I started to cycle because football was more of a social thing and I was, and it was a good way to sort of see my friends every weekend. And we were the same group of guys. We've been playing for over 10 years now. Um, but I sort of stopped playing. I... I feel like I could play football for the rest of my life every single day and not get better. <laughs> but when I started to cycle, I was, I was getting, I was getting better quickly. So I was just like, this is a no brainer for me. It's time to stop football because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not good. I'm not, I don't like we played sort of a, a very average standards and I was far from a standout player in our team. So I was just had to had to let it go because I was just getting so much more sort of even not that I was competing cy cycling, but I was getting so much more personal satisfaction out of it because I could see improvements. Yeah, and that was that was before trainer road or anything like that. I just I was just getting faster on the bike just just by sort of commuting and and riding on the weekends. Did the social component play into it at all as well? You mentioned that you had this social kind of group with football and then going over to cycling your peers and everything else cycle. So was that an easy transition as well? Well, not so none of the, none of the football guys cycle. I've got a few, I've got other friends in different, in other sort of groups that cycle. So I cycle with them, but they, it, it wasn't a huge sort of social, social, it wasn't the social side that drew me to it. The social side came later, I'd say. So the big draw really was the fact that like, you could see that you were getting better at something. And I, yeah. I understand that that's, that's like, that's addicting because yeah. improvement, I feel like that's probably hard coded into each one of us. We just love improve, improvement mm. in many different regards. And so with cycling in particular, you can see that as you're able to, like you mentioned, even pre trainer road, just do more miles or cover them quicker yeah. or, you know, just any number of different ways you can measure it. So, so what brought you to the point where you, you're riding bikes casually on the weekends and that sort of a thing, riding with groups every once in a while, what made you get to the point where you wanted to actually train for something? And that's probably our doorway into trainer road. Um, well, I, so I joined a gym and I didn't join the, the gym for cycling. I just sort of put on a bit of weight and it was, it was time to join the gym. And they had <laughs> they had what bikes at the gym, um, and that so I was training. I was sort of drawn to those because I'd never trained with power, and sort of everywhere you read, it's 
power is like the the one. If you if you want to take it, if you want to take training seriously, power is you need to know your power. So I want to once I sort of saw all the numbers in front of me, I, it makes it very clear, and you can track everything so clearly. There's no guesswork, and you can see that progression in black and white. And that sort of that analytical side was quite attractive to me. Um, so after after sort of using the Watt bike, so they the, the Watt bike has an app which is quite which is you know okay, but you need to buy a Watt bike to use it. Sure. <laughs> um. So so after sort of and the, and the gym membership was fairly expensive. So I I just thought I'm I'm I wasn't lifting weights. I wasn't doing anything else. I was going to the I was cycling to the gym to cycle on the Watt bike. <laughs> <laughs> I, need to, I, need cut, I need to sort of streamline this a bit. So I've got, got a smart trainer and and then it was a case of you know looking around, looking at the other the other programs like Zwift. I used Zwift but a, a couple of times, and I didn't really I didn't really like the sort of gamey side of it I was I, I like the numbers I like the sort of analytical data driven side of it so using trainer road was was much better for me so, you know the, the clear layout and the just the sort of progress bar running across the screen all, all of that that clear sort of data driven method was much better for me so where what was your starting point at this point, you had already been cycling for a decent period of time. Once again, like you had said, I love that you were cycling to the gym to cycle at the gym and then cycling home from the gym. Yeah. So, uh, you had obviously put in quite a lot of time already and you were tracking improvement and wanted to see that, but what was your starting point when we're talking about power to weight for you when you first started using trainer road? So when I started going to the gym, I was about 85 kilos. And I did an FTP test, a 20 minute FTP test on the Watt bike. And uh, my FTP came out about 280, sort of somewhere 275, 285, somewhere around there. And so I like, just worked out it's sort of 3.3, 3.4 watts per kilo. Mm -hmm. And that's at 187 pounds in terms of the weight for those that are listening to this and for conversion from kilograms. Yeah, so I was probably when once I got a trainer road, I was probably well. I, I I was higher than that. I was sort of at about three thirteen FTP. I I couldn't say what weight I was at, but I was probably around eighty. And then that sort of first six to twelve weeks with the sweet spot, the sweet spot build sort of old base. Sorry, one and two. Of my FT, I my FTP went up by like thirty watts. It was like or to like twenty five, thirty watts straight to sort of three thirty five, three forty. Wow! And I couldn't believe it. And sort of following sub like after sort of subsequent FTP tests, the the increase sort of was was more gradual. Sort of it was a, st a steadier increase, but I was still losing weight. Which like we, I don't, I was I wasn't sort of weight conscious, but I go it's like talking about that uh, like the data driven sort of numbers side of it. When I could see my like my watts per kilo going up, or yeah, I, I was like this is brilliant. And the and the weight loss was never sort of dramatic or as I said, I, I wasn't sort of driven by losing weight. It it just it was a it was a byproduct of cycling to and from work and then doing the workouts on the turbo. Yeah. It's, it's the byproduct of chasing performance. Right. Mm. Um, and that changes things substantially. But one thing I, I think is really important to point out is that initially you probably had, if you measured from the very beginning of time, you probably had a period of beginner, they, they call them beginner gains a lot of the time, right. Where it's like yeah. rapid yeah. improvement. And then you got to the point where you probably took a 20 minute FTP test. And I assume that the improvement probably wasn't rapid all the way up into that point. 
Then after you took that 20 minute test with that watt bike, then I'm sure that, you know, once you introduce some sort of structure at the gym, you probably saw an increase. Then once you use trainer road, you saw a big increase, which is common because it's properly structured training, but then you continue to see it. And one point that I think is really important with this is a lot of the time there's criticism from athletes that are frustrated because they don't see the sort of beginner gains that they once saw. And when they see other people feel them, a lot of the time they want to call them out and find a justification for it. Right. Uh, but he here's the thing you pointed out something very important. You still saw a gradual improvement. What sort of improvement was that like? So you had your beginner gains where you boom, you spiked up again. And then thereafter you started to see power improvement. You still saw it. It just wasn't quite on the same level. So can you put that into context for us in terms of like, how much were you seeing over six months or a couple of months Were you, how many Watts did you go up? So I think I got, I got my turbo trainer in September, uh, 2019. And I think the highest FTP. So at, at that point I did a sort of the Ram test and I think I got sort of three thirty, like a month or two after using it. And then the highest that I ever got was three, five, eight in March of this year. Wow. And that was sort of, I, I mentioned before, I was sort of, I think I was overtrained at that point because that I was, I got an injury shortly after and like, I was so, cause it was, it was all, it was all really new to me. So I was ab almost obsessive. Like I loved it. I'd, I'd never miss, I'd never miss a sort of, uh, a workout on the, on the calendar sort of thing. And I remember there was one that I couldn't do and I was straight on the forum. Has anyone had problems with this workout? <laughs> and someone, someone responded to me. He was like, your, your progression isn't going to be linear for the rest of time. There will be a workout with, that you can't complete and you will, your FTP will go, FTP will go down. It's just, it's, it's going to happen. So don't sort of beat yourself up because you didn't do this one workout sort of thing. That's cool. <clears throat> Good on them. So that's over sort of around six months. What's that about another sort of 25, 30 Watts in six months in that sort of steady progression period. Mm. So I want to talk about that, that very thing of how you managed that like the, the, the roadblocks that you came across frustration points, anything else, what was hard about structured training considering that, you know, you didn't come into this and you didn't have like, you weren't, you didn't have a background as an Olympic athlete that went to an Olympic training center and had structured training and a ton of other mm -hmm. stuff. Sport was social in many regards for you. So what was hard about structured training for you? The hardest part is for, for everyone is juggling everything else around it. So where I live is it's a small flat. We've got sort of our kitchen, our living room, and then the bedroom. And there's the turbo trainer is set up in the living room. So I would, the, the, the hardest part is, is the noise. Like obviously they're not silent. And for my partner, if, if, if we finish dinner, and you know she wants to sort of watch TV in the in the living room. Then we're then there's a bit of a sort of a disagreement because I want because I want to go on the server trainer and she wants to watch the TV. So it's it that that's that's the biggest difficulty t timing it because I'm I'm not really very good in the mornings. I c I couldn't get up before work, do an hour and a half or an hour on the turbo, mm. and then. I'd, it would just be, it would be too early for me. I, I'd, I'd end up skipping a lot of workouts because of that. Mm. So I'd say, yeah, just, just doing it around other people. And I'm sort of, in terms of other commitments, I don't have any children. I My work pattern is very normal, sort of half eight till five or something like that. So there's no, there are a lot of people who have it harder than me. But even when you're, even when you don't have many commitments, it can still, I found that it can still be challenging. There's a lot of sort of compromise and it helps when you're like my partner, she's sort of, 
she jumps on the turbo every now and again so she understands and she sort of understands how much like I enjoy it so there's there's give and take and there's compromise which is really really useful yeah that that so a couple of key points that I've found in there number one I like how you're realistic with yourself in the sense that you say, sure, you could try to do early morning workouts, but you're likely it's not very, it's not easy for you. So you're likely to skip more workouts. That's a really good perspective of trying to find ways to make it harder to skip workouts or less likely to skip workouts. Mm. Cause if you pattern your life around that, that can, that can help a ton. Yeah. Well, I see, I see well, on the forum and stuff. I see guys who are up at sort of five in the morning five half five in the morning and i just there's no way i could do that i don't like that i think that is sort of the next level if you want to be very competitive in in racing you that's the sort of dedication that it takes yeah and that's that and the thing is it's easy to beat yourself up over that and if you're yeah. like well why can't why aren't i doing that or why yeah, why am yeah, i not doing yeah. that Hey, did you did you struggle with that at all? Kind of, but then the more I read, these guys would say, "Oh, my kids, my wife, and stuff like that." I I don't have that, so I can go on the turbo at ten p.m. or 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 half nine at night, sort of thing. And and it's not too bad. I haven't got to worry about picking kids up or putting kids to bed, or you know, is are my kids going to wake up if I if I go on the bike? So I think that a lot of guys will have to go on early to get it done and out of the way so they can then deal with the rest of their sort of massive list that they've got to get through in the day. Whereas I, I don't really have that. Yeah. What other barriers? You talked about juggling everything around your life and how that's the, the hard part and the barrier to training. But did you come across any frustration points or plateaus in your training at all? or discover something seemingly auxiliary to it, but whether it's nutrition, hydration, or equipment, or anything else that you found was a barrier, but then you found a way to work through it? Um, I wouldn't, I think injury is, is the only one. I'd say, I'd, and that is sort of like, well, I've got a, I spoke to a physio about, about the injury that I mentioned before, what sort of after I was, I have seen these massive gains, you know, the biggest FTP that I'd ever sort of recorded. And then along came this injury. <clears throat> and he sort of recommended two weeks off the bike. And I was just like, two weeks? Like, that's... I, I sort of tried the the odd sort of easy ride in between, but it just, it hurt a lot. Even walking hurt a lot. It was like the back of, the behind my knee, sort of the tendons around inside your knee. I don't, I don't know what ones exactly, but were really sore and after that I did a, I did an FTP test when I was sort of back on the bike and it had, it had dropped sort of it had dropped quite a lot actually sort of 10% and I was like man that's so when I say I think I was overtraining like everywhere I'd read it was sort of you'll lose a, a few percent if you take two weeks off and what I dropped 10% so I sort of must have been right at the red line really smash that ramp test to get such a high FTP result mm. and then for it to fall so much, it was quite disheartening, but I just, you just have to, I just have to accept the, accept the result and go on. There's no point trying to work out, trying to do the workouts at a 10% higher FTP. You'll never get, I'll sort of never get through them. Sure. So how did you move forward from that? Uh, did you drop your FTP or just lower the intensity of the workouts? And how, how did you get back to a semblance of normal again? So that came, so that, uh, that came after doing um, sustained power build. So I'd been doing all these sort of threshold workouts and I'd really got a, a nice sort of threshold sweet spot engine. And uh, I tried to sort of game it. I, I mentioned to you before, I tried to then go into a, the crit specialty. And I just, after these two weeks, I, I tried to do the crit specialty and I just couldn't do it. My, I sort of didn't have the right, hadn't been training the right systems. So I just went back to 
sort of went back to basics, started doing the sort of e- the easier workouts, less taxing. I think I, I think I started again on rolling road. Um, so is it is it build? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the the specialty plan there. Yeah, the specialty phase, the final one. Oh no, is that short? No, I no, I did short power build. I did short power build the, the middle one because uh, yeah, I just I was like, there's um, there's no point in trying to do something that I can't do. So I went, I went back and just started again at the lower FTP. I didn't I didn't feel like I needed to do another another base because I was cycling to and from work. So I, I was getting those sort of base miles in already. So I, I, I went, went back and did another build. And that sort of has put me back on the right track. And that sort of takes me back to where I am now, actually. I did the, I did the road race specialty and got through that fine because I've been sort of training the right systems. Mm. So it all... It all works. I haven't hit that high FTP that I once that I got beforehand again, but I'm not. Um, I'm not obsessive about getting it. You're probably a better performing athlete too. Yeah, yeah. I yeah, I I think so. Yeah, and that brings us to the takeaways that you see out on the road. Have you what sort of tangible performance improvements have you seen out on the road? when you're riding with your friends, I know this year you had crits targeted, but if you're listening yeah. to this and this is in the past, it's the year 2020. So not many crits happened. So, uh, what sort of improvements did you see on the road that kept you encouraged and kept you motivated? Well, I'd, you know, it's the, the old school, the average speed was just so much higher than it was sort of a year and a half to two years ago. Like I'd, re- I'd really have to, go all out to try and sort of hold 20 miles an hour for an hour. And I'd feel really chuffed with myself if I managed to do that. But now that's, that's, that's not really a challenge. That'll be me. So sort of, that would be riding at sort of tempo, mm. you know, not, not pushing, but not like really, really pushing. I, I could do it for sort of two to three hours now, rather than having to really push to do it for one. You know, I'll go out and I'll sort of, if I, if I'm riding somewhere I haven't ridden before, and I'm and I'm sort of pushing it, I always come back. Well, not always, but I'll often come back and see sort of a few top tens on Strava and stuff like that. And that's it's really like it's it's so good. You feel so good when you when you get those, or you you know you pick up a KOM, even if it's like a, a, a like a super short one or something, or one with like. 30 people have ridden if you still feel good about yourself getting those <laughs> sure. top tens yeah yeah no doubt no doubt so jack i kind of want to recap uh wh- what what was your what have you come to now with like your power to weight ratio now where are you at in terms of watts and then power uh compared <clears> to uh, so it's, a, it's a it's about 4.8 now somewhere around there if, like my, if my weight fluctuates sort of i'm about 72 kilos now that might go up or up or down, sort of a kilo or half a kilo. Sure, that's impressive. Four point eight. That's <clears> a high. That's a high ratio. Uh, what? What? So that and then starting out. Uh, I, I'll have to do the math here, but starting out, you saw a significant improvement then in terms of weight loss that you saw, which was just nothing you focused on, but it just happened mm-hmm. as you focused on consistent structured training, and then your power, of course, has gone up throughout that whole thing. And now, yeah, so after I'd specializing, say, yeah, I'd say the power really sort of like the power shot went up really sharply, and then gradually, then continues to gradually rise, and the weight has just gradually declined the for since I've started. I'd say I think now I, I I've sort of plateaued the weight loss, and I don't really want to lose any more mm. because I don't, because I don't need to, and this you know, I'd sort of start to look a bit unhealthy. I think if I sort of <laughs> lost it in more weight. Yeah. Health first, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't sort of, I don't crave junk food or anything like that. So it's not difficult for me to stay on top of it. I can sort of, I feel like because of the cycling, I can pretty much eat what I like. And then because, because it is, because I'm sort of a 
train at a fairly high FTP, most of the workouts that are over an hour or an hour and a half, they sort they normally burn off a lot upwards of a thousand calories. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not really something that I need to, that I feel like I need to worry about. Yeah. How do you fuel your training and, and do you prescribe any type of diet in particular? So I'm, I don't, I don't, I don't really know much about sort of the nutrition side of things and I'm not sort of heavy into supplements or yeah, I don't, I don't really, I don't really sort of, un, I haven't dug into the science behind that because it's just almost intimidating. There's so much, there's so much to learn and so much to know. Mm. So I eat quite carb heavy and mainly plant-based. I, I don't eat much meat, maybe sort of once or twice a month I eat meat, predominantly vegetarian. Sure. So that would be loads of sort of pasta and just mainly mainly whole foods, you know, like even, even on the bike it will be whole foods, a lot of bananas, a lot of fruit, and then sort of a, a carby-based meal, based meal throughout the day. So that, that puts you, I mean, roughly when you started with trainer roads, somewhere around 3.6 Watts per kilogram up to around 4.8 Watt, well, 4.8 Watts per kilogram followed sweet spot base and went into short power build and you've done the rolling road race specialty plans, just giving people a recap of everything that we, yeah. we've talked about here, found a point where you went way up and then you had to kind of reset from there. And now you've probably at the point where you're the most well-rounded and balanced athlete that you've been. Mm -hmm which is awesome. Uh, so what, what's your goal? What's your motivation? What are you training for now? Hopefully with 2021 <laughs> bringing better times. Yeah, so, so I think next year or sort of when racing starts again, if there's like races in the winter, I want to, I, I want to start doing crits and seeing how I get on with those. I, um, I did the idea. I've sort of done the, the plan builder. So I've now got sort of workout scheduled but as far as the calendar goes sort of thing. So I haven't got to worry about any of that. I suppose when races start getting released, I can, I can change that and sort of do another short power build and then the crit specialty and sort of get those, get those right systems trained for the events. But I've, I want to try and sort of, so it, because I've only, I've only done one race up till now. So I'm cat four in the UK. I want to try and get sort of through the, through the categories, you know, yeah. maybe up sort of like cat three or cat two. I'd say cat, I'd say cat two is a bit too ambitious for one year. Maybe I don't know. With 4.8 Watts per kilogram, uh, you can do some damage. Also having a big FTP and crits is always really helpful. So if you, if you follow the race analysis videos that we publish on YouTube yeah. and then with all the training, you'll be like, you'll have a really big leg up on a lot of competitors. Yeah, yeah. We've heard from a number of different athletes from the UK that have gone from cat four up to cat one, even in a year. So uh -huh. just by they, they really work hard and hit the pavement, but it's totally possible. So yeah. I shouldn't say hit the pavement, very bad use of that. <laughs> say <laughs> <laughs> They work really hard and make sure they show up to all the races. So, yeah. uh, Jack, I really appreciate you taking the time for this. Uh, once again, if people want to find out more about Jack's improvement, ask Jack specific things about how he got better, maybe how he manages the training and noise relationship with the TV in the living room <laughs> with his significant other, who knows any of the details, the diet, all that stuff. You can head over to trainerode.com slash forum and check it out. Jack, if people want to get in touch with you, what's the best way to do it? Uh, on Instagram through the forum, uh, the forum, the forum is great. You know, I'm sort of pretty active on the forum. Yeah. I'd say, I'd say the forum, the forum is the best way. Perfect. Cool. Well, with that, we will talk to you all next time. If you want to be on the successful athletes podcast, you can submit that go to trainerroadcom slash podcast, and then you'll be able to click a link there to go to the successful athletes podcast. And you can submit your story there and let us know how trainer road made you a faster cyclist. Hopefully we can share that then with a bunch of other people through this podcast. It'd be awesome. So check out trainerroadcom and we will talk to you all next week. Thanks everybody.